Hi there, it's Ian here, and you're watching Grumpy Opinions, the show where I'm going to tell you all about what I think of films, TV shows, games, and life in general. Let's get on with the show. Westworld is a TV show made by HBO, based on the 1970s movie of the same name, written by Michael Crichton. Now the third season of it's come to a close, and I can say with some surety and some sadness that the release of episode 8, Crisis Theory, was the day that Westworld died. Not the end of the show, they've got another season in the pipeline, but this is the point where for me, certainly, the magic's gone. Completely. And the finale of season 8 starts off with Caleb scooting back into town after last week's episode, and he's following the directions that his little doohickey gave him, one that presumably Dolores gave to him before she died. And it leads him to a derelict building where he finds a crate, and inside it is an old school Dolores body. And luckily, he had the foresight to bring her pearl with him. He pops it back inside the face, and she finally tells him what she knows about the Delos Park, and that because the army rented one of the parks back in the day for military training, she actually already knows everything about him in his mind because they scanned it using the helmets, and points out that maybe he only actually helped her in the alleyway because he vaguely remembered her from back in those days. Days when he stopped his squad from enjoying the spoils of war with the hosts in the park after they were done with their shooting for the day. And because the death is never really permanent here, Maeve is also back up and running, and Serac has spotted Caleb on some of the security feeds, so they send out a bunch of heavies to pick him up. And that leads to Dolores and Caleb getting into some shootouts with some bad guys, but luckily they use a little phone app to hire more bodyguards, and it all gets a bit crazy and there's gunfights everywhere, and eventually Hale starts appealing as a hologram to Dolores somehow, and tells her that she's already actually given away their position and hired people to kill them. So Caleb and Big D split up, and she ends up having a massive fight out with Maeve, and some goons of hers on a bridge and then down on the street below, and just at the point when she's about to win, she decides not to kill Maeve and walks away, and then Hale freezes her motor functions, allowing Maeve to capture her. Meanwhile, Caleb keeps bumping into people who call him Sir, who've been hired by the app to get him to Serac's headquarters, and despite all the crazy riots, his two pals turn up, and they give him a hand to steal a flying cop car, and he jets off and breaks into the big place. But there he gets attacked by Serac's top guy, but he beats him. And once he's dead, Maeve appears, with a whole load of other security guards who just hadn't turned up yet. And he ends up getting taken to Serac, and he finds that Dolores has been hooked up to Rehoboam, and she's having her memory deleted a chunk at a time until she gives up the key. And there's an awful lot of chat and threatening that goes on until eventually, Maeve realises that everything that Serac's saying is actually being fed to him by Rehoboam. And that really irritates her, because he's not actually any kind of special guy, he's just a puppet. And finally, just before Dolores is totally wiped away, Maeve decides to jump into her head using her computer technology powers and finds a memory of her standing beside a tree. And they chat a little bit about how Dolores doesn't actually want to kill humanity because she loves humanity and kindness and goodness and sees all the good in everything. And that her plan all along was never actually to kill them, but to set them free. And Maeve's like, well, I've had enough. And she turns on Serac, and he obviously freezes her. But then she manages to make a zapper explode because she's gained that ability somehow. And then the lights go out again, somehow, and she kills all the guards and does a stab on him. But Robum won't answer to his commands anymore, because it turns out that when Dolores was uploading to him, she managed to change the user profiles, and she's now put Caleb in total control. And Caleb decides to turn everything off, obviously. And him and Maeve walk out onto a bridge and watch as part of the city starts to explode. Meanwhile, Team Stubnard, who were still being held up by William last week, end up getting into a shootout, and Stubbs get shot, which you'd expect. And then Bernard end up going into like super bad mode, but before he can kill William, he gets interrupted by a bunch of cops and William runs away. And old Bill goes back to Delos and starts drinking posh whiskey and ends up getting himself on the no longer dead list. And then he sets out to wipe all the hosts from all the different Delos facilities. And he ends up in Dubai, where he finds a all healed hail. But he doesn't shoot her. And then a host version of him, which he does shoot. But he doesn't shoot him in the head. And it kills him dead by slitting his throat. Oh well, bye bye William. Bernard, on the other hand, finds that the cops actually were being led by Lawrence another host who was apparently still working for Dolores, and he gives Bernard the briefcase. Remember that? So Bernard scoops up what's left of Stubbs and drives to a house somewhere where he's instructed, and it turns out it's Arnold's old house when Arnold's old wife's there, and she assumes that he is Arnold, and they both cry about their dead son, which gives him some kind of closure. And then they're off to a wee hotel somewhere where Pop and Stubbs in a bathtub of ice manages to hold off the rot a wee while, and Bernard says, don't worry, I'm just going to check this thing out, and opens up the case and puts on a big VR headset. And it's apparently a machine that accesses the robot heaven, because it turns out that Bernard had the key in his head all along, Dolores never had it. And then he wakes up again, coated in a thick layer of dust many, many, many years later, where presumably things have gone pretty badly. 
So what did I think? Well, I think this has been a really strange season at Westworld. I mean, the show had a very odd starting point this season. I mean, a clear ending point that obviously they wanted to get to. But in the middle, they had pretty limitless potential to get through the entire story. I mean, it was a show where we only had the smallest of hints what lay outside the cowboy theme park at the end of season one. And most of the show had kind of taken place in there for the first two seasons. So the little bits we'd actually seen outside of it were only snippets. So to step out into a completely different world with a clear goal that the season was going to end with a major apocalypse down the line seemed fairly straightforward. I mean, I, I kind of suspected that right from the beginning. And also it was demonstrated by the post credit stinger at the end of season two. Oh, fuck. And as I've said a couple of times, in some ways, this was the season of Westworld that I didn't think they actually really wanted to make, but they couldn't avoid making because they needed the story to plausibly get to the setup for this fourth and presumably final season when the show's going to go into some kind of crazy genre mashup of things like Terminator Salvation with humans fighting machines and a dash of Mad Max and maybe even a bit of a future western feel with things like The Book of Eli or maybe bits from the Dark Tower movie when they flashed into Roland doing his gunslinger in the apocalypse thing. Just a guess, but we'll see. But to get to that point, they had to move from this glitzy, postmodern cyberpunk futurescape into this apocalypse in only one season. And I made the point earlier on in one previous review that this is all very much based on The Tempest, but actually, having seen the end, what this final episode really reminded me of was The Wizard of Oz, because it turns out that the man behind the curtain actually was the puppet and the machine itself was the controller. And I kind of like that subversion in a few ways, because, because it's almost inconceivable that a computer like Rehoboam would actually possibly allow as much of this to occur, even with the anomalies existing, without allowing for some of these things to happen. For starters, Rehoboam must have been able to predict that Maeve would eventually have worked out that Serac was a puppet, and that she could overpower the pause machine, a machine that it designed for him. So with that in mind, the final outcome of this actually seems to be partly Rehoboam's own decision to put things into the hands of Caleb. Whether it actually wanted him to have the choice or not is another matter, whether it actually expected him to turn him off is another matter that's never going to be explained. But also, I would like to say that this episode looked great. In fact, the whole season looked really, really well. I mean, there's nothing you can say against the way the season looked. The cinematography was almost always fantastic. And I have mentioned that this all had a bit of a look of the Deus Ex games, and that being the closest thing that I can think of to this exact style of it. And the City Riots really reminded me of some of the things in the trailers for those games, and it also reminded me of the film AI. And of course, I think that was absolutely intentional in both cases, because this show is absolutely nothing if it's not openly derivative of many other things. But I'll touch on that more later. And to its credit, this did tell an understandable and complete story this season, and it was a story that was easy enough for even the slowest people in the room to understand it. Unlike the very overbaked and convoluted spaghetti script sort of season two, where everything was all anachronistic timelines and characters and all over the place and who was who and what was going on and who was real and all the other bizarre gibberish that happened in season two. And I actually quite liked season two, but it was a mess. And it's also finally put a bunch of characters to bed, since effectively Dolores is dead now for reals. Although plainly, since Evan Rachel Wood has said she is actually signed up to appear in another season in some capacity, as has it, Aaron Paul and some of the other actors, she's obviously not completely dead. She could turn up as a computer program or a flashback or anything. But for the most extents and purposes, I think Dolores' story is finished. And I'd also like to point out that while I have some issues with it, which I will mention, there was a lot of stuff I liked in this. And one thing I actually ended up liking even though I had problems with it, was the idea that William, after all these acts of evil in the show, and then this whole point where he tries to find some kind of bonkers redemption and dies in the process, utterly failing what to do what he set out to do, and he's been replaced by what is essentially the Yul Brynner character from the original movie. He is the man in black. He is the evil cowboy. And that's kind of what he always was, only in human form. And I think that's, that's not the worst idea that the show's had. And the show is also telling us that there's going to be a very major apocalypse very shortly after the end of the season. Because, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, Bernard said that there was going to be an apocalypse or the end of the world. And he locked himself and Stubbs in the hotel room. And it looks like you know, they rented it. And after five minutes, he did his big sleep. And he wakes up untouched and unmoved for enough time for that much of dust and sand to have settled on him, which looks like it's been a long time. And I think the producers have said it's been several years at least or maybe even 20 or 30 years. I mean, it's been a long time. So that also suggests that Stubbs is probably dead by now because he couldn't move himself. He said he was basically bleeding out. And even though he is a machine, he did seem to sit up and kind of look and he looked to see what Bernard was looking at. So maybe he's got the motability to move, but you think he would have done something with Bernard. I don't know. It seems odd. I mean, I don't know why they hadn't killed the character off before. So who knows? He may well turn up next season. 
And despite everything else in this episode, the scene with Bernard and Lauren was actually really nicely done. I mean, for a change, the old person makeup on Zoe from Firefly actually looked really good, and it was kind of a sweet and touching scene, and it was a chance for Jeffrey Eck to actually do some acting this season, rather than just running around looking really confused all the time. But let's be honest, there was so much about this week's episode that wasn't very good, and that's one of the reasons that I think that this is probably the death knell of the show. I mean, let's just start with some of the simple wee daft things to begin with. Like, for example, how last week that EMP wiped out Dolores and Maeve, and presumably managed to kill all the people that were in cryogenic stasis there, but somehow it didn't manage to break the USB stick that Caleb had, or his phone, or the little doohickey that Dolores had given him that managed to lead him to her new body. Your destination is 3547 Hope Street. That's really good tech for a bunch of civilian appliances, but not for a supercomputer or a host body, even though it also didn't manage to bother the brain pearls inside. Or the fact that anybody can pilot any vehicle randomly, including cop cars with no keys and no problem. And that few random people can push over an anti-riot blockade like it's made of balsa wood. Or how the cops are using tear gas and riot shields to put down a riot, but they're not actually using any kind of future taser guns or making use of the riot robots in any good way. Or how constant gunfights constantly break out in this show, and yet the heroes still have this amazing ability to stand in the open and never get hit by a bullet. And extras in the background either completely miss open shots, or don't even bother aiming at them and firing, instead they just run up and try and punch them. Or who Maeve is still walking about with this katana and using it. Although credit to the show, it was a decent setup for this moment where Dolores' old school body comes in kinda handy, but it would have been a lot handier if Maeve had just had a gun, or better yet, a taser, and then that fight would have been over in seconds, because did they not realise that tasers take down these guys? Why, why is Maeve walking around with a, a samurai sword when she could literally just zap Dolores unconscious? Or how the fact that Maeve gets the sudden ability to hack Zarek's earpiece, and also his off button, just when it's convenient to the plot. Or how the USB thing was a MacGuffin all along and didn't actually matter. Or like how many times Serac actually says to take Caleb away and kill him, and his bodyguards just kind of stand there and not really do much. Or how the entire plot revolves around Dolores wanting to actually get beaten and hooked up to Robum, and her whole plan seemed to revolve around getting frozen by Hale. Even though she wanted to get beaten there, she didn't actually bother trying to beat Maeve. And... It just made no sense. I mean, I presume she could also have just walked into the place and plugged herself in. But it all seems a bit convenient. And how no one in the show, even those who know better, ever shoot anybody in the head. Except for the one time we actually see William do a headshot, he shoots a human security guard. And then goes for a bunch of body shots against his own doppelganger when he's given the chance of an easy headshot. And he just doesn't even try to shoot Hale because, pfft, reasons. I mean, your guess is good as mine. And the entire character of William was completely ruined this season. And part of that was the fact that they did absolutely nothing with the initial premise of the season, when he was still all screwed up about killing his daughter and having flashbacks and she was haunting him. And then Dolores started haunting him. And then suddenly he just became this one note, one line, boring waste of screen time. I mean, it's like the HBO special. They did the same thing to Jon Snow in Game of Thrones. I don't want it. I told you I don't want it. I never wanted a crown. Paris is our queen. She is our queen. She'll be a good queen. You are my queen. Only with Ed Harris, he wasn't walking around going, she's my queen. He was walking around going, I have a role to play now. I'm going to save the world. I'm going to save the fucking world. Now, I'm not surprised that Ed Harris went on record saying that he really didn't like what they did with William this season. And I kind of almost wish they just left him in the asylum back in the middle of the season. Because, let's face it, at least then he'd still be alive. But now he's dead, and we've now got Robot William instead. And while I didn't actually mind the idea of that, I don't know what they can do with the character that's going to be anything other than boring. And the seeming final insult to the Williams story is the fact that they make such a big point a few episodes before this of actually mentioning that he's one of these people who can't actually be predicted. What kind of people? People like him. They call them outliers. He's one of the variables that Solomon and that Rehoboam couldn't actually understand. And yet, somehow, Dolores can completely understand him. She's completely got William's number. You're right on time, William. So if she can do that using a little bit of information, why can't a supercomputer, in fact two supercomputers, designed specifically to figure this stuff out, predict what he's going to do? It just doesn't make any sense. It just makes Dolores overpowered again, no matter what body she's in. And speaking of characters that don't have any point, I'd like to flag up how Bernard gets the magic briefcase, the address, and drives around for most of the day and all night without ever bothering to patch up his bloody beaten and dying Stubbs pal. But he does find the time to visit the address that he was given by Lawrence, or whether or not that's, that might actually be another Dolores in Lawrence's body, that was never made clear. But at some point, he did actually find time to put bandages on Stubbs, and find ice to put him in the bath with in some vodka shots. But he didn't actually spend the two minutes it would have taken to seal up the wounds with one of those wee heat guns that they fixed themselves with. 
Or why Lawrence and his pals couldn't have helped out with that. I mean, they're literally a whole bunch of cops just standing around doing nothing. And even if they were fake cops and just hired, uh, they would presumably want to help out in some way if they could. Now, Bernard is a strange character. I mean, he's kind of a weird, mentally broken, quirky guy. But the audience just doesn't seem to know what's going on in his story. And it, we're waiting on some revelation of something happening. And the revelation that the secret thing in his head was actually the key. I mean, that was it. That was kind of a massive letdown. Because his entire plot up until this point had been finding Dolores and stopping her. And then he literally just stops at one point and goes, and She wasn't trying to exterminate the human race. She was trying to save it. And now everyone's her friend. Like, everybody likes Dolores at the end for no particular reason. Everyone apart from Hale, who actually probably has the least reason to dislike her. Who Hale who should basically still like Dolores but hate the humans. And the plain fact is, every single character this season has been ruined. They've just been made completely terrible. The Hale version of Dolores has gone completely psycho. I mean, she had a taste of the nice life and then had it ripped away and she decided that A, it was Sarek's fault for blowing up her fam, but then it was also Dolores' fault because she let it happen or wasn't sympathetic enough and now she has to die and also all the humans have to die. And basically everybody has to die, except sadly not Tessa Thompson's character because presumably at this point the show is synonymous with having an evil robot lassie as the main lead so they don't want to change that and it's better to switch out actresses than continue than coming up with something different or whatever. It's just lazy and it means we've still got our Maeve versus Dolores palaver as our big sort of showdown but they've now side switched that so Dolores Dolores is gone and we've got new Dolores who Maeve can fight against and I don't entirely understand why they're doing this because Hale's stepping up to the plate to fulfil a destiny that everyone thought that the normal Dolores was going to try before she went all kind of peace and happy love child. And that's before we get to Caleb who is the biggest non-entity of the entire show. I mean that character's entire purpose was basically to be the audience insert every man and drag through Dolores' story and watching what happens and then occasionally asking a question. And only to have a backstory that was weaker than the protagonist of basically every computer game ever. And that's the problem. Caleb's problem is Caleb who feels like the protagonist in a video game and watching the show feels like you're playing a bad computer game. And I feel that like maybe that was part of the point, something I said a few times, but the trouble is it just felt boring, tired and unoriginal. Because the fact is, video game stories usually make for really bad films and you don't need to be Roger Ebert or Mark Kermode to figure that one out. What's more, the story here felt unsatisfying because ultimately the entire whole of Dolores' argument was based on a lie. And what do I mean by that? Well. Her whole argument is that she didn't want to destroy humanity, she wanted to set them free, and she didn't want to take away their ability to choose. The problem with that is in order to do that she went out and found the guy who had had the most things happen to him in his past to grind him down to the bottom and make him hate Serac and Rehoboam and everything that was done to him so that he was the one guy who would definitely choose to turn it all off in the end. So she knew exactly what he was going to do and that was why she specifically went after him which makes the entire concept of giving him a choice complete nonsense because it was already a foregone conclusion. I wasn't sure if you would. And I don't have a problem with the lack of free will because lack of free will was established way back in season 2 when Dolores went into the forge and met computer Logan version and he told her that he had worked out that humans only had a very simple and small amount of data that ran their minds. Humans don't change at all. The best they can do is to live according to their code. But none of them are truly in control of their actions. And that was what they said in season two. So now we are in season three and they're living up to that. So humans don't have choice in this story universe, which makes everything she said a lie. And it bugs me because they've built an entire season out of that premise only to cack handedly argue that they weren't and that humans have free will, but actually proving at the same time that they don't and that they can be predicted really easily, making the whole thing really, really dull. And what the real story breaker that comes in for me is this whole uh, I knew that you knew that I knew stuff with that, you know, the Sherlock Holmes problem I mentioned the previous week. You see, the problem with this kind of story is that Westworld has made it clear that Dolores and Maeve are both super smart. Or at least Maeve was last season. This time around she seems to actually be less intelligent than she was last season, which doesn't make an awful lot of sense and they never mentioned if Serac made her less intelligent, but yeah, she doesn't seem particularly bright now but she does have the ability to control any technology she sees. And Hale seems to be starting to do that as well, for no reason that's been explained. Although I presume that's to set up Hale and Maeve having literal sort of superhero powers for the showdown in season 4, as they'll basically be opposing gods. 
But somehow, and here's the kicker, somehow Dolores is cleverer than not one, but two different supercomputers, each designed with the sole purpose of plotting out and predicting what humans are going to do in the future of the human race and everyone's actions. And yet, she herself manages to plot out an entire domino effect of events, puts Caleb at the centre of it all, and the only reason he doesn't die repeatedly is sheer dumb luck. And I hate that sort of plot. I mean, it can be fun in something. Um, well, I'm not going to spoil like the films that end that way, but there's a lot of films that are, are quite kind and entertaining, but when you get to the end and you think, actually, no, that couldn't have worked because there were too many variables. And at the end, the bad guy or sometimes the good guy saying, aha, well, I knew that this would happen, so I plotted for this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And you just think, there's no way. There's just no way that could have happened. And if the whole plan was to get Caleb into that building, I mean, God, there are easier ways. She could have just gotten a job there. I mean, she can hack the system and get do anything, basically, with technology. She can change bank accounts. She can change people's IDs. She can get cars to come. She literally could have just given him a job there. He could have walked in. It would have been fine. And then she could have let herself be captured, and he could have burst in and pressed the button, and that would have been the plan sorted. There, I've written your ending for you. But it's also nuts that the entire episode rests upon the idea that she can get inside the machine and hack it from the inside. I mean, remember, they can't predict Dolores, so Robin and Serac should still be able to predict Maeve's actions, because they have the technology, they've got hold of some of the hosts, they understand how they work. So if she had the ability to hack any system, Maeve, if Maeve has the ability to hack any system, they should expect that Dolores could also be able to hack a system. And they would be expecting that Dolores could hack in when she got connected. I mean, hell, any moron with a PC would tell you that you don't plug anything into your big computer without running a virus scan. You would never connect a computer that wasn't safe directly into your big system. You would connect it to like an individual computer that wasn't in the network. And this is actually exactly what happened in the movie Skyfall, the James Bond movie. The good guys got the bad guy's computer, they locked him up in a cell, they plugged it into their main computer in MI5, and it hacked them from the inside, released him, and because he'd magically plotted out exactly what everyone was going to do, he set off a chain of domino events and escaped and tried to kill off M. Now, a lot of people pointed out how stupid all that was, not only the, the fact that MI5 would be stupid enough to plug a, a potentially virus-ridden computer right into their mainframe, but then at the same time the fact that he managed to get through all this because he'd plotted everything out in advance like some kind of super genius. Now, this is exactly the same thing happening in Westworld. But more than that, this show also ripped off the ending of the worst of all of the Terry Pratchett Discworld novels. Now, if you've ever read Carper Jugulum, you'll know what I mean. And if not, super quick rundown for an old book. Apologies, spoilers if you've never read it. But it's about vampires attacking a fantasy land, and the good guys are witches and they have to stop them. And at the end, the main witch allows the vampires to bite her, but instead of her getting vampirized, she somehow magics her blood to make them start acting like her. And then she stops herself becoming a vampire by basically having a deep and introspective look at herself and tells herself off, and she's fine. It's an awful, awful ending of a book. And there's lots of problems with that book, because he also rips off one of his earlier books for the plot. Just skip it. But, I mean, do read his other books, because, you know, Terry was a really great writer, and, you know, which actually makes it even worse, because he was a great writer, and he suddenly had this book that was terrible. And now we've got a show that started off with a great first season that is now lifting stuff that is terrible from other books. And it's a terrible end, a terrible rip-off of many things. I mean, the whole setting them free motif wasn't enough, but they actually had to straight up lift the end of Fight Club, like the final shot of Fight Club. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> And not only that, that's made worse by the fact that Mr. Robot, a different show, actually did a much better homage of Fight Club in the first season. And a lot of the stuff in that was even more on the nose, because they wanted you to know that was what they were doing. I wanted to save the world. This just got to this point and went, yeah, um, yeah, Fight Club, we can't think of anything else to do at the end. You liked Fight Club, didn't you? There you go. And needless to say, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed at all. Season 3 has been an absolute mess. Hence the fact that I've spent so long saying how bad of a mess it is. And it's a mess that could have been so much more. But instead of doing something interesting, they wound themselves into predictable mediocrity and facile boredom. And it means really that this has turned out to be the worst season so far out of all of Westworld. That showed through sheer letdown and lack of storytelling ambition. I mean, this show could have done so many things. There was so much scope for ideas, and there was a sheer number of theories online about it 
that shows how many of the fans could have thought of themselves, how much potential there was, but instead they opted for the most basic story they could with a really naff ending and a midpoint twist that oh, half of the bad guys were just copies of the same personality. Great. Well done. I mean, you basically took the idea from Orphan Black and turned it inside out and made it crap. Great. Fantastic. Great job, guys. And where does that leave us? Well, as I said, that leaves us at the point where the next episode of the show will probably be in about three years' time. And frankly, it sounds like the audience has been dropping off the face of the planet as far as this is concerned. And they're still making the show, so clearly some people watch it, but there's no interest. There's practically no buzz about it online. There's very few reviews. I'm one of the only people I know that actually reviews the show. I mean, there's a couple of other channels, sure, but it's not on the same scale as something like Game of Thrones or even Doctor Who. Nobody seems to care about this show. And on top of that, sure, they might. the, the last season might be fantastic. It might be a big post-apocalypse Mad Max style romp with cowboy robots and it could be a bit of a giggle. But at this point, they've taken all the things that were fun in the first season, and that they still had in the second season, and they've just kind of tossed them out the window for a story that felt half-baked, even though this was all made by exactly the same people. So I think this is it. This is the day that Westworld died. And I'm sorry for everybody. I may cover the next season when it comes out, but that's going to be a long time from now. So for me, this has been Ian, and these have been my grumpy opinions. And as always, big love to all my patrons and everyone watching the show, but most especially to Judith Coloma, Michelle Forbes and Joyce Dingman. I'm really sorry how long it took this episode to come out, but as you can see, it was a bit of a beast. But I hope everybody is well, you all take care, bye bye now.